If our nation has one true center, a heart to its heartland, then it may well be the state of Oklahoma. Situated smack between the east and west coasts, a place where, as the song goes, the wind comes sweeping around the plain, and where life at the start of the 21st century retains a straightforward simplicity that is quintessentially American. So it was altogether fitting and proper that for one week in June of 2001, golf's national championship came here to Tulsa, and 155 players battled to dethrone Tiger Woods and become the 101st United States Open champion. All of the best and brightest assembled, their faces etched with an intensity that bespoke the occasion. But this would be a wide open open, where only four men, none of them household names, would manage to better par. And in the end, it was the rigor of the golf course and the enormity of the pressure that prevailed. Unbelievable. And no single player was spared. The United States Golf Association presents highlights of the 101st United States Open Championship. On the eve of the championship, the number one question was, can anyone beat Tiger Woods? Not since Bobby Jones had there been so prohibitive a favorite. Not since Jones had a player strung together four consecutive major championships. But as Tiger Woods pursued number five, others pursued him and goals of their own. With a victory at the Buick Invitational, Phil Mickelson was in top form and seemed more ready than ever to break through for his first major title. For David Duval, 2001 had brought both consistency and frustration, most notably at the Masters, where he'd suffered an agonizing runner-up finish to Woods. Like Mickelson, he was gunning for major number one, and like Mickelson, he seemed ready to take charge. The game's hottest player coming into the Open was 21-year-old Sergio Garcia. With a victory and a second place finish in his previous two starts, the young Spaniard had proved he might be ready too. And the industrious Vijay Singh had come to Tulsa a week early to play practice rounds, in hopes of adding an Open crown to go with his Masters and PGA titles. But the final drama would come not from these stars, but from the supporting cast, as Stuart Sink played steadily into contention. Mark Brooks rose to the top for the first time in five years. And a soft-spoken South African named Ratif Goosen showed the world what resilience is all about. Gray skies and a gentle breeze greeted Argentina's Angel Cabrero at 6.30 a.m as he fired the first shot of the 101st U.S. Open. Cabrera would post a fine even par 70 on Thursday. 56-year-old Hale Irwin, the oldest man in the field, reached back and recaptured the game that had brought him three U.S. Open titles. On the senior tour where he has dominated for the past six years, Irwin is rarely asked to play par threes with a four-wood. But with this tee shot to the 225-yard eighth hole, he proved but he still has the touch. And the touch was also there with his putter. Irwin made the turn in one under par and then started the back nine with this birdie from 10 feet. Then at the 14th with the flag stick positioned by a front bunker, he played another elegant shot. This is right at him. It's the right distance. Another fabulous shot out of Rome. And with this putt, the reigning senior Open champion took the lead at the U.S. Open. After a bogey at 15 and a poor tee shot at 16, he was scrambling. But oh, what a par putt this was.
But the old master saved his best for last. This was his approach shot to the almost unimaginably difficult number 18. What a golf shot that is. You can't say enough about that to within a foot and a half of the hole. Wow. Only eight birdies were made here on Thursday, and that was the best of them. A three under par 67 for Hale Irwin. Meanwhile, in the same threesome with Irwin, Lauren Roberts made some noise of his own. Roberts had suffered a six on the lone par five on the front nine, but he got revenge at number 13. Clubs. Anyone in the game? <laughs> a victory lap. <laughs> Up against the fringe at the next hole, he bellied a wedge the way only a tour player can belly a wedge. And Lauren Roberts finished the day at one under par. Phil Mickelson was playing solid, steady golf at one under par for the first 12 holes. Then at the par five 13th, he showed why his short game is the envy of his colleagues. This deft shot set up a birdie, but he followed with bogeys at 14 and 15. And then at 18, it looked like more trouble. Chasing up. That is a wonderful shot. Mickelson two putted from there for an even par round of 70. Meanwhile, Garcia had begun his day with a bogey and was still one over par when he came to number 13 and his third shot. The sand wedge didn't exactly eat up the hole. But when you are the best 21-year-old golfer in the world, a twisting downhill 20-footer is not much more than a walk in the park. To the left, did he give it enough? <laughs> and a straight uphill 50-footer? Well, nothing more than child's play. This closing birdie put Garcia among the top 10 at even par. Meanwhile, Bernard Langer, more than twice the age of Garcia, was playing some of his best golf with top six finishes in his last four U.S. events. Always a fine iron player, Langer had come to Tulsa with his distances dialed in. He turned the front nine in 33. Then, at the par three 11th, he hit the best shot of the day. Oh, oh, how about that? That would take the two-time Masters champion to three under. But his good work would be undone with this shot at 13. Off the tree and into the pond, a double bogey seven followed by two bogeys brought him in at one over par. I watched the interview that you did. I thought it was very good. Thank Appreciate you. it. You bet. Good luck. A handshake from Byron Nelson got David Duval's day off to an inspiring start. He showed the touch of a champion with this birdie putt at number four. Duval turned in one over, got back to even par with this birdie at 10, and finished that way, along with Garcia and Mickelson at even par. A solid start. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 12.30 starting time. From Windermere, Florida, United States Open champion, Tiger Woods. The defending champion's opening shot was not a good one. This one is headed down the right-hand side, Roger. I didn't like it. and that wry little smile belied a large measure of displeasure. Wood saved par at one, but struggled again at two. Leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it. Well, he left it, but short. The frustration was showing early. You 
Usually, wood sticks do most of the talking, but on Thursday, they needed some help. His first eight holes brought him seven pars and a bogey. And when this one missed, he had a double bogey six and an outward half of 38. Not the guy we remember from Pebble Beach a year before. Matt Gogol's up and down round of 70 featured three sixes and five birdies, including this bomb at number 15. But the man posting the most red numbers was Retief Goosen, who opened with birdies at the first two holes and then fired this one at the flag at number seven. This putt to tie Hale Irwin for the lead at three under par. Drops it in. And he wasn't through yet. At the next hole, his stylish swing produced one of the best shots of the day. How about that? What a beautiful shot. But before Goosen could stroke that putt, a siren blared. An afternoon thunderstorm had moved into the Tulsa area. 66 competitors had completed their rounds, but 90 had not and would not until Friday. And so after an abbreviated day one, it was Hale Irwin at three under, matched by Retief Goosen with 11 holes yet to play. By Friday morning, the clouds had passed, the course had dried out, and play was ready to resume. Measuring 6,973 yards with a par of 70, Southern Hills, designed by Perry Maxwell, paused a daunting challenge. Twice before the Open had come to Southern Hills, in 1958, Oklahoma native Tommy Bolt led wire to wire as he shot 283, good for a four-shot victory over Gary Player. In 1977, Hubert Green shot two under par to win by a stroke over Lou Graham. And most people expected Tiger Woods to join their company. But with seven holes to play, he picked up where he'd left off in an uncharacteristic struggle with his swing. Nothing was going right for him, not his tee shots, not even his short game. Through his first four holes on Friday, he made three pars and a bogey. The only bright moment came on this approach shot to number 15. The birdie got him back to even for the morning, but his score for round one would be an unlikely 74. Meanwhile, 15 and a half hours after hitting the green of number eight, Retief Goosen stroked his putt to take sole possession of the lead, and he followed with another one at nine. That gave him an eye-popping 30 on the front nine. Then, at the day's easiest hole, par five number 13, Goosen attacked with his wedge. And promptly finished the job with his red-hot putter. Even after bogeys at 16 and 17, Goosen would have the low score for round one, 66. My expectation was to play well. I uh, played very well the week before. It's just my putting wasn't up to standard. I didn't make any putts, so uh, it was nice coming into that week, hitting the ball just as good as I was hitting the couple of weeks before, and uh, finally started making some putts, and that was the difference. But others were close behind. Mike Weir's 67 included just 23 putts, the fewest of anyone in the field. And with bunker shots like this one, it's easy to see why. And J.L. Lewis began the back nine with three threes and ended with this four for a 68 that gave him sole possession of fourth place. So with round one finally completed on Friday morning, it was South Africa's Retief Goosen on top with a four under 66 as the pride of Canada, Mike Weir joined Hale Irwin one stroke back. J.L. Lewis was followed by a quintet of players at one under and 11 others at even par. 
Meanwhile, Tiger Woods, the man who won last year's Open by a record 15 strokes, began this one eight strokes behind. For Mark Brooks, round one had ended sourly with a double bogey for a 72. But round two would be a different story. This glorious approach shot to the first hole set the tone for the day. Left hand side of the fairway and oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> what a shot. At number two, the putt was a bit longer, but the result was exactly the same. Birdie. Brooks, the 1996 PGA champion, is a streaky player, and Friday, he seemed to be in the middle of one of those streaks. This approach set up his third birdie in the first four holes. And even the 640-yard fifth, the longest par five in U.S. Open history, was an easy mark. He would get that putt to drop, making it four out of five. Could he possibly make it five out of six? Yes, he could. Out in 30 strokes, he got birdie number six at the 11th hole. And when this one fell for par at 18, Mark Brooks had himself an incredible 64. With a two-day total of 136, he was the leader in the clubhouse. It had been one heavenly afternoon. But Brooks wasn't the only star in the 12-20 starting time. J.L. Lewis was paired with him, and he continued his strong play, and particularly his strong putting. That slam dunk at number four put him three under for the championship. Lewis had only one tour victory on his resume, but after a second straight 68, he found himself atop the leaderboard. Oh, what a shot. great golf shot. He is really firing some shots at the hole. But the 18-hole leader had no intention of going away. They say par is your friend at the U.S. Open, and on Friday afternoon, Ratif Goosen parred the first 12 holes he played, including this all-world up and down at number eight. Then he broke his string. But in the right way, with this birdie at number 13. He bogeyed at 14, but at 17, he fired right at the flag and nearly hit it. A birdie there, a bogey at 18, and Ratif Goosen made it a threesome atop the leaderboard at four under. The majesty of the United States Open is that it welcomes all comers, any golfer, amateur or professional, with a handicap index not exceeding 1.4, can pay the entry fee and tee it up for a chance to compete with the finest players in the world. Line them up, let them go. Players young and old chasing the fantasy of competing for the national championship. The journey began in mid-May for 8,132 players at 101 local sites in 40 states. Less than one in 10 made it to the sectionals, where 764 golfers, including those exempt from local qualifying, competed for a place at Southern Hills. One of the survivors was Gary Nicholas, medalist in Columbus, Ohio, and he enjoyed flashes of brilliance like this beautiful approach to number three. But it was a difficult two days both for father Jack Nicholas, who was following in the gallery, and son inside the ropes as Gary missed the 36-hole cut. Only three members of this year's open field were amateurs, but all three were thoroughbreds, like 49-year-old John Harris of Minneapolis, who won the U.S. Amateur in 1993 and was in the field here at Southern Hills for the 1977 U.S. Open. Bryce Mulder of Conway, Arkansas, is a collegiate All-America and medalist at last year's World Amateur Team Championship. In four years at Georgia Tech, Mulder broke Tiger Woods' NCAA career scoring mark with an average of 70.67 strokes per round, thanks in part to an ability to make putts like this one at number 18. The 
The third amateur in the field was Jeff Quinney of Eugene, Oregon, the 2000 U.S. Amateur Champion. He struggled throughout the first two days and ended up missing the cut, but occasionally there were bright spots too. Surprisingly, Quinney's fellow competitor Tiger Woods had some work to do if he was going to make the cut and play on the weekend. That fine bunker shot helped him save par at 10. Still, with eight holes to go, he was six over par, right on the cut line. But no one savors a challenge more than Woods. That birdie at 12 got him going in the right direction. And when this one hit the jar at 13, he had some room. With a 71, Tiger beat the cut score by a stroke. Still at 145, he was nine strokes out of the lead. The man ranked number two in the world, Phil Mickelson, was in a much better position. And it looks awfully good, Phil. It's really How good. about it? <laughs> Phil, how's your day going so far? That took Mickelson to one under for the championship. He would bogey the fifth hole, but Mickelson is nothing if not resilient. One hop and an ace. A hole in one at number six, 174 yards of perfection with an eight iron. Mickelson would finish with a 69 and admit maybe this was his week. The 466 yard 18th played as the toughest hole of the championship. This tricky downhiller gave Jim Furyk a rare birdie and left him at even par after two rounds. After a first round 72, Davis Love wanted to make a move he came out firing at number one. That putt would not go in, but one hole later, this one would. Looks good, Gary. It does look good. Oh, what a nice birdie. Love was on a roll. Davis Love would make the turn in 32, and despite a bogey at 14 and a double at 15, he moved up the board with a 69. Beautiful golf shot. Meanwhile, Thursday's victor would become Friday's victim. Hale Irwin battled the greens from the very first hole. He would miss another par putt at the second. And then this one at number five. At the eighth, the five footer he needed was for bogey. And that didn't go in. 27 putts yesterday, 33 today instead of a 67, his score was a 75. David Duval got himself quickly under par for the championship with this birdie at number one. After making the turn in 34, he gave a stroke back at number 10. But he erased that mistake when he rammed this one confidently home at number 13. Duval seemed ready to take charge of the championship, especially after this at the par three of 14. It's pretty well done here, looky here, yeah. yeah. Back to back birdies. But bogeys at 15 and 17 derailed him, and he needed this birdie at 18 for a 69 and a share of six. Birdie attempt oh, on the man. way and rolls in. Wow, he's made some nice putts this championship. Very quietly, Stuart Sink had opened the championship with a 69. And on Friday afternoon, he continued to climb stealthily up the leaderboard. As a result of Thursday's rain delay, it was well into the evening when Sink curled in this one at 15 to go to two under for the championship. So after two rounds of the 101st US Open, Goose and Brooks and Lewis atop the leaderboard, but some impressive names in hot pursuit. Colin Montgomery, Paul Azinger, Davis Love III. And take a look at some of the names who would be going home for the weekend. Only one of the three amateur competitors survived to the weekend, Bryce Mulder. And in round three, he thrilled the gallery with a brilliant 68. Mulder has a flair for the dramatic and a short game that enables him to tame even the toughest of courses. He would finish the championship as low amateur in a tie for 30th. 
On Saturday morning, Tiger Woods and his coach Butch Harmon looked for answers. But on Saturday afternoon, they were slow in coming. He bogeyed number one. His swing looked as solid as ever, but through 13 holes, he had three bogeys and just two birdies. And then this one evened the score. And at 17, at last, into red numbers. A 69 for round three. Paul Azinger had opened the championship with a 74. He followed with a 67 on Friday, and then on Saturday, a 69 to move into the thick of contention with 18 to go. Oh, he shows on this shot. This one of the best shots of the day. Rocco Mediate came to Southern Hills with an ailing back that was so bad he considered pulling out. Luckily, some work with a chiropractor got him ready to play. After opening the third round with a string of five cars, he hit this eight iron to number six. Then, he leaned on the long shafted putter and it came through. He got close to the par five 13th and two but needed a little bit of artistry and imagination. Looks like he played a marvelous golf shot. He did that. The birdie there took him to three under for the championship. And then at 16, he hit what he later called About a silly putt. Up the hill, turning left, last roll. Birdie three, just the 10th birdie of the day. At the 16th, moves him to four under par. He finished with 67, just one stroke out of the lead. Meanwhile, his fellow competitor, Phil Mickelson, also played well. Saturday, June 16th, was Mickelson's 31st birthday, and he celebrated with a low score. The first present he gave himself was this putt. And it's another good start for Mickelson. No one was driving the ball longer this week than Mickelson, who averaged 322 yards off the tee. His vaunted wedge game was firing on all cylinders, as evidenced by this stroke of genius at number two. Oh, that's beautifully played. That should funnel right toward the hole. You believe that, Jack Gary? And he was giving himself plenty of opportunities for birdie. That one took him to three under for the championship. From 30 feet at number five, this was for his third birdie of the day. And it's good. At seven, he short-sided himself in the bunker, but saving par seemed to be no problem. A bogey at number 10 slowed him down a bit, but after a titanic tee shot at 13, he took aim at Eagle. The whole location is just ripe for Eagles today. Look at this shot. Very, very likely to make that putt. This, however, was the worst of all putts. Under borrowed and over hit, and it must have shaken his confidence. Because, unbelievably, he missed the next one as well. Boy, I'm telling you, he has missed some putts. It's just so unusual. He can make the doggone curly cue putts and stand right there and miss that one. So that is an enormous opportunity, Don. But in another display of Mickelson resilience, he bounced back with birdies at 14 and 17. Mickelson finished with a 68 for a three-day total of 207. Three off the pace at the start of the day, David Duval was ready to make his move. After a par at the first, he was scrambling at two, but scrambling rather effectively. This is a beautifully played shot. How about the touch on that? Oh, unbelievable, Johnny. <laughs> Out of that three and a half, four inch Bermuda rough. He made his par and then bogeyed three. His approach shot to the fourth was on target all the way, but he was unable to convert the birdie. And so it was not until the par five fifth and this deft chip shot that he got himself back under par for the championship. That's gonna be a birdie for Duvall at the fifth. A crucial moment at number nine, 
His drive stopped in the crosswalk, and the result was a pedestrian shot. It brought a bogey, an outward nine of 36, and frustration for David Duval. Coming home, Duval posted a birdie, a bogey, and seven pars as he finished with a 71. Good draw, pin, accessibility-wise. Good play, a little bit of a safety there, but it's still on the green. Stewart Sink started disastrously in the third round with a bogey at one and a double at two, but he kept on grinding. This for birdie at the fourth. And at the brutish par five, 647 yard fifth, his putter remained absolutely red hot. Then he stepped to the tee box on the par three, sixth hole. Shot absolutely covering the flag. Setting up his third birdie in a row. On the seventh, his fourth birdie in a row. Out in 34, Stuart Sink was three under for the championship. A string of pars followed, and then Sink was back on the attack at the 13th. And at 15, this putt for the sixth birdie of the day. Sink would finish the day with just 25 putts and a superb score of 67. One of the best moves on moving day came from Sergio Garcia. Starting at two under for the championship, he made a pair of opening pars and then bagged this twisting, turning beauty at number three. Got a chance. Two holes later, out of the rough, under branches, over sand, he performed some magic. And when he converted the birdie, he was within just one single stroke of the lead. After bogeying number seven, this was for birdie at number 10. It should turn a little right at the hole, but not that much. Ah, Mark, Mark, oh. Mark. <laughs> Back putt, pass the hole, exit stage right, put it in reverse, it's in. He parred 11, but bogey 12, so at 13, the easiest hole of the week, he was thinking birdie. And this shot gave him a very good chance. Real good shot, little dead hand there. This was to get back to four under for the championship. And in it goes. El Nino had one more birdie putt left in him at number 15. Garcia posted a 68 for the day. But as he glanced back at the leaderboard, he wasn't happy. He had wanted to play in the final pairing on Sunday, and his 206 total had fallen just short. Mark Brooks also started slowly with a bogey at two, but got it back with his birdie at the third. And this was for birdie at the par 4 15. Brooks finished the day with an even par 70. Retief Goosen played rock solid golf, tee to green the first two rounds. Look at that bend, and the first man in this championship to reach five under. Retief Goosen. In the third, his shot making was less precise. Whoa. Oh, that's kind of top neck. That bad. Well, it's Really badly miss it, John. You don't see it often, but it does happen. The pros make a mistake, and frequently, this is what follows. A beautiful recovery shot. This remarkable birdie was a clear demonstration of Goosen's intense focus and determination. But look at his face, you'd never know it. At 17, a wayward approach left him an exceedingly difficult oh, pitch. Coming very softly. Oh, oh, that is just wonderful. Oh, look at this, Johnny, look at this. Might go in. Oh. <laughs> 
He parred every single hole on the back nine and finished with a 69. I was trying to keep myself thinking that it's just another golf tournament. You just got to keep playing, you know, be in the present and uh, focus on what's lying ahead. Don't uh, try and get uh, too much involved with what uh, the tournament is, you know, and uh, just try and by the end of the week be ahead. And so after 54 holes, the seemingly impassive Retief Goosen stood atop the leaderboard, tied with Stuart Sink in back of him. A threesome at four under par and an impressive list of names not far behind. A 68 by the lone remaining amateur put Bryce Mulder in a tie for 23rd, improbably with Tiger Woods. The final round of the U.S. Open. Only the men who have conquered it have felt its indescribable emotions. Its unparalleled power. It is a championship which taps an inner strength, a strength even they thought never existed. They believed, and it happened. Payne Stewart is the 1999 U.S. Open champion. Oh Today, it's their turn to see if they belong, to see what lies beneath. Today, it's all on the line. All questions will be answered, and all accounts will be settled. Today, the golf course awaits, ready to separate the best from the rest. No one had practiced for this championship harder than Vijay Singh. And on Sunday, that practice finally paid off. Now it'll start turning dead left. Look at this. Look at this. This bomb at number 15 was his sixth birdie of the day. And he wasn't finished. An ideal tee shot at 16 put him in position to attack. Oh, and look at this shot. Oh. He would make the birdie there as well. Then, from 139 yards on 17, he threw another dart straight at the bullseye. Oh, what a round of golf VJ has going today. With the final round of 64, Singh jumped into a tie for seven. Meanwhile, another red-hot round was in the works. This is about three first downs away. And its perpetrator was another one of those old guys. Fifty-two-year-old Tom Kite showed the kids how it's done. That's why those fans sit there all day. Kite made the turn in 33, added birdies at 10 and 11, and when this one disappeared at 13, he was five under for the day. With this approach at 17, the 1992 U.S. Open champion reminded us why he's regarded as one of the best wedge players in the world. Roll that one in for birdie as well. And so at 18, this putt was to tie the single round U.S. Open record of 63. Look at this. <laughs> what a round for the 92 U.S. Open champion. David Duval still had a chance to win his first major, but he'd have to play the round of his life. And this was not the way to begin it. One over after one. He remained that way after six, and even his masterful recovery shot could not do more than save him par. Through 13 holes, Duval had still gained no ground, but it was the final par three that put an end to his hopes. With a double bogey, he slid to a 74 and a tie for 16. Phil Mickelson was playing in the 32nd major of his career, and he was still looking for victory number one. The first shot of the day did not bode well, and neither did the second. But he was able to get up and down for par and sailed along smoothly until the fourth hole where his trusty wedge betrayed him and led to a bogey.
By the next hole, however, that wedge was back in magnificent form. And he's done it. What a shot. What a shot by Mickelson. Attacking, looking like it might go in. But when he made bogeys at 9, 10, and here at the par 5 13th, it was clear that once again, Mickelson would come up short in a major. Many had expected Sergio Garcia to command on Sunday. But if his multiple grip pumps were any indication, the young man was just a little bit too uncomfortable. Count them. On this particular swing, 18 grips and regrips. Well, he has pulled this one way to the left, and Johnny, I did not count all those waggles, but I'll tell you, if that golf club were a tube of toothpaste, it would be empty. <laughs> Garcia went out in 39 strokes, back in 38, and finished at three over in a tie for 12th. When Rocco Mediate teed off on Sunday afternoon, he was one shot off the lead with the best chance he'd ever had to win a major. Big drive at number one left him just a sand wedge to the green. Well, with a full one, whatever it was, he hit it hard. Had to be a sand wedge, Johnny. That should spin. This then was to pull into a tie at the top of the leaderboard at five under par with Sink and Goosen. Mediate's front nine was a bit of an adventure as he posted three pars, three bogeys, and three birdies. He was out in 35, even par. But on the incoming nine, Mediate stumbled with bogeys at 10, 11, and 17 and fell out of contention. Mediate had earlier said that if you birdie the 18th to win the championship, they should give you two of them. Well, he birdied it, but the closing 72 was not good enough. He finished in fourth place at two under. In the end, the battle for the 101st U.S. Open would come down to three relatively unheralded players. Mark Brooks had not played under this kind of pressure since his win in the PGA at Valhalla five years ago. He struggled for pars on the first four holes. Oh, and he knows that short. Yeah, that's very well played. And then on the fifth hole, this putt for par. Whether pulled or incorrectly read, it didn't go in. A front nine of 36 would not help his cause. But Stuart Sink was off to an equally shaky start. Thanks to this bunker shot, he was able to save par at the first. Oh, beautiful play. No boogie on that one, it doesn't look like. Well, that's got to calm his nerves a bit. Then, after missing the fairway at number two, he was forced to play defensive again. But from a lie in the rough 181 yards away, he played some very impressive well, defense. Stretched very well. This what a is shot. fabulous shot. Thanks to that shot, he secured an easy par. Like Brooks, Sink managed a quartet of opening pars, but then faltered at the long hole. In fact, Sink matched Brooks hole for hole on the outward nine for a 36. Retief Goosen got off a solid tee shot at the first. Going down the right side of the fairway. Well, I know, I've been very nervous standing on that first tee, but, uh, you know, I knew I had a pretty good chance of winning this tournament now. Um, but, uh, you know, I was trying to just you know, play my own game and hit shot for shot, and if I happen to win, it's, it's great. At number two, a poor drive had him scrambling all the way. This third shot was well played, but it left him a nerve-testing 10-footer. Boy, we've seen him hold a lot of pressure-packed putts. Together, the three leaders combined for just one birdie on the front nine, and an unlikely one it was. How about this? How about oh, this? Oh, my! <laughs> that gave Retief Goosen a one-stroke lead. But two holes later, he gave it right back. Chip shot horribly judged. 
With bogeys at eight and nine, Goosen matched his two rivals with a one over 36. And so the shootout shifted to the back nine. At number 11, Brooks struck with an iron. The man from Texas clearly found his rhythm. His putt, right on target as well, and back into a three-way tie. Meanwhile, one hole back, Goosen had a chance to pull ahead. An easy putt, really. That's where you want to putt from, John, it's right there. Bogies, Goosen comes back with a birdie at 10, gets back to five under, and regains sole possession of the lead. But not for long. Sink on 11. Very high, start at the center of the green, turning right at the flagstick. Oh, this is good. This is good, Roger, within center, eight feet of the flag, underneath the hole. Good strike. Stewart sank to five under par. And back into a tie with Goosen. And once again, Mr. Brooks was about to join them. With this towering iron to number 13, he set up a two-putt birdie that took him to five under as well. Thirteen had yielded more birdies than any hole on the course, but for Stewart's sink, it brought trouble. T-shot pulled well left, headed toward the trees down the left-hand side. Be careful, there's a little ditch over there. A bogey six took Sink back to four under par. One hole later, however, Goosen ran his birdie putt past the cup and then missed this one for par, a mistake that foretold a much bigger error to come. Now one stroke behind Brooks, Retief Goosen took dead aim at the 15th flag. And by the time this ball stopped, he had a 12-footer for birdie. Pretty darn good shot. That's isn't it? unbelievably good. If the three putt at 14 was in his mind, this stroke certainly didn't show it. Back into a tie with Brooks. But up at 18, Brooks had left his approach quite a distance from the hole. Look at how much break there is. Probably 10 feet he's played. And he gave it a pretty good ride. And that was not a good putt there. The result, a lengthy return putt for par. That is the very definition of agonizing. And so with the closing bogey, Mark Brooks parted a round of 70, a 72-hole total of 276, four under par. Now all he could do was to wait. Sink, also at four under par, needed a birdie to pull even with Goosen. By the little right of the hole, drawing back. Wants it to spin back there. And it will come back, Roger. What a shot by Sink. Down in the funnel, what a great shot. Talk about delivering at the moment. And so it was. Sink and Goosen all even with one hole to play. One very difficult hole. Stuart Sink left himself a long approach. This ball turning left. Oh man, that is not good. Goosen, after a perfect drive, then hit the approach shot of his life. Goosen had very high cutting. It's at the flagstick. I don't know if it'll get up into this breeze. It, is it does. Up. It is up, and it is safely on. What a shot. Just a perfect yardage for a good six signing, and. Uh, Pushed it by two yards. I was trying to hit it just left of the flag, and I hit it just right of the flag. And I couldn't hit it really in a better spot. If Goosen's position was perfect, Sinks couldn't have been worse. It's going to get there, Rod? No, I don't think it's going to get all the way down there, John. Oh, no. Just got too much of a chunk. Didn't have any momentum. Is he going to have to putt first also? I think he does. I think he'll be away slightly. Then there was this to save par.
it could not have come much closer. It's a beautiful putter, just two inches slower, it's in. By missing his par putt, Sink thought he had lost the championship. Actually, he hadn't. But after hurrying the next one, oh, man. he had. You can tell his mind was somewhere else, Roger. Heartbroken, Johnny. Yep, just over the tournament. The championship's over. Well, I was a little bit shocked that he missed it. You know, I mean, uh, obviously he felt like he lost the tournament. Uh, he had such a good par putt. He thought he really made it. Uh, it just turned left in front of the hole on him. Uh, yeah, at, uh, at that stage I knew, well, there's two putts to win a tournament for me, and, uh, you know, just roll it up close. That was my, really, my main thought. I wasn't trying to make it or anything. I just, a bit of rush of blood and just hit it too hard. That was a little friskier than he had in mind, I can tell you that. Well, there wasn't any real need to hit it a foot and a half, two feet by the hole here now. I still uh, thought to myself, you know, just knock it in. It's, uh, I knew the line exactly. It was just the off-center right putt. Unbelievable. And he's still not in. And then I had a really tough putt to try and stay in it, you know, after what's going on, you know. And, uh, and uh, I just had the putt that Stuart Sink just missed, so uh, it was mentally wise, uh, quite trying to make that one. Now he's in. Incredibly, this open had not closed. With three putts from three yards, Latif Goosen had backed into a tie with Mark Brooks. Now the two of them and the rest of the world would have to wait one more day and 18 more holes to determine the champion. The scoreboard said it all. So after 72 holes, this was how the scoreboard looked. But on this day, for this Open, there would be one more round to play. 18 holes, Brooks and Goosen for the championship. A long shot when he'd arrived in Tulsa, 40-year-old Mark Brooks now had a remarkable second shot. As for Retief Goosen, he'd led the championship from day one. The question now was, could he gather himself and win it on day five? On Monday morning, they returned face to face to see who would take home the trophy. The South African predicted he'd be relaxed, and on the first tee, it appeared to be the case. Solid strike going right down the center of the fairway. Good way to start here, good swing. Could Brooks answer that shot? This two right down the middle. Both players off to a good start. So this 18-hole playoff is underway. Two great shots, who would crack first? After the first two approach shots, the answer appeared to be Goosen. But then he did this. Looks absolutely perfect. Is that gonna go in? Oh! What a shot. Came about as close as you could without dropping in. But an errant drive at number two left him facing a third shot of 150 yards. And he hit it exactly a bit right 150 yards. Oh, what a Good shot. shot. <laughs> this time it was Brooks' turn to show some short game. And he did. This one will break to his left, and it's quick when it gets in the area of the hole. Really well played there. Now Goosen to save par. There it is. Another marvelous par at the second for Retief Goosen. He'll remain at even par. The first blood came at number three, where Brooks hit this marvelous approach shot. It's a pretty good looking shot if it'll get to the hole. Yeah.
Could the South African get up and down for par for the third hole in a row? On this hole, there was never a doubt. But this one for Birdie was just as solid. One up for Brooks. After they matched pars at holes four and five, Goosen struck another one of his skyscraping string straight irons. Oh, good shot. Good shot. And then, stroked another one straight into the hole. All even after six. Then at the next hole, the first stumble of the day, when Brooks missed the fairway, missed the green, and then missed this putt for par. At number eight, Goosen appeared to be in trouble again. But once again, with one swing. That was really, really well executed. Nice shot. He turned it into a tap in par. But the great divide began at nine, where Brooks was bothered by a tree. That was the danger right there. And took a bogey five. Meanwhile, Goosen made three and took a three-stroke lead. Good looking putt. Really good looking putt. Wow. Has he been on fire with his putter and his short game? At the 10th, the gap widened again as Brooks bogeyed and Goosen played this magnificent approach from the rough. And followed with yet another perfectly calibrated putt. Look at this, Roger Malfi. Right in the middle. He has made everything he's looked at today. Now his lead was a commanding five strokes. At 14, he left himself a teaser for par. Is this the same fellow who three putted 18? Needing to make something happen, Brooks hit it close at 15. But couldn't convert. Again, at 16, he stiffed it, but couldn't stuff it. And then at 17, where Goosen made bogey, Brooks finally rolled one home, and suddenly, the gap was down to three. And he gets it done. But with only one hole to go, Goosen was in firm command. Short of the green and two, he minimized his risk. Now what. that's a conservative play, John. I'll tell you what, that is a brilliant play, I think. From here, he could actually afford to take three putts. Hard enough. Cozying it up. For a final round 70 to win. There it is, Ratif Goosen from South Africa, the 2001 U.S. Open champion. And so a round of even par 70 and a two-stroke victory. I was pretty relieved that it's finally over. It's been a very long week. I played seven rounds of golf in a row. It was, uh, it's been a long tiring week and a heat there. I don't think I had any energy to jump up and down. <laughs> about it, but uh, you know, when I finally got home, and it all started sinking in. And it was, uh, it's great winning an Open Championship, and uh, you know, it's, it's opened a lot of doors for me, and uh, I'm going to grab it all and enjoy it. Ratif Goosen, 2001 U.S. Open Champion. He led all four rounds, but that is not what people will remember. They'll remember how he blew the putt on Sunday and then came back boldly on Monday to claim his championship.